hello, and welcome again to a Beatles talk show podcast called Things We Said Today. This is a show in which we talk about anything that has to do with the Beatles, their music, their history, their years together, their years apart, what's going on in the news, anything we feel like talking about. We can do so on this show, and we do this bi-weekly, every two weeks. I'm Ken Michaels. I'm one of the three regular co-hosts for this show, known for my syndicated Beatles radio program called Every Little Thing. Also, another podcast show on the solo Beatles called Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast, and also for my Beatles-centric website, KenMichaelsRadio.com. And I'm being joined by my two regulars. First of all, a man who's been a part of New York Radio now for more than 35 years. He's been a mainstay on uh, New York's WFUV. He is their Beatle expert there at the station. He's done a ton of great uh, interviews and lots of great specials for the station. And that's our own Darren DeVivo. Hi, Darren. How are you? And thank you very much for considering me a regular host as opposed to an irregular host. Uh, hi, everyone, and uh, welcome aboard another uh, Things We Said Today. Well, sometimes you are a regular, but we won't get I'm into very that. irregular. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> not to end up going down that road. But. <laughs> <laughs> also, we have with us our resident musicologist, who for many years worked as a writer for the classical department at the New York Times. You also know him as the author of a couple of Beatle books, Got That Something, How the Beatles I Want to Hold Your Hand Changed Everything, and also The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop. He's a freelance writer as well for many different publications, like the Wall Street Journal, for example, and that's Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hello, Ken. How's it going? Pretty good. Before we continue, I was just reminded of how one of our listeners wrote to us because he was trying to find your book, Got That Something. And you want to just let our our listeners know if that book, actually both your books are still available? Um, the Fiden one, The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop, is available so far as I know. And Got That Something, uh, that was sort of published as an ebook by New York Times Books and a company called Byliner. Then Byliner went out of business and um I think the whole thing is is now out of print. Um I should try to get the rights back to it and put it out again. There are some things I'd want to change in it, I think. And uh but in the meantime, I'm hard at work on the first volume of the McCartney Legacy, which is due in 10 months and should be out another nine months after that. So in 19 months, another one should be in print. <laughs> so you don't realize this, but I have my countdown clock going right wow. now on my computer for your book. Well, so, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say, Alan, you're not counting, are you? <laughs> it's actually yeah, 10 and a half months about, yeah. <laughs> Let me adjust yeah. it. Wait a minute. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, on the show this time out, we're going to be talking about what we feel was the best year that the Beatles had in their solo careers. And by that, I mean collectively or any combination of the Beatles. It's not what was John's best year, or what was Paul's best year. It was one year that represented the solo Beatles and which one you would pick as being their best year. We're all going to share our views on that. That'll be a little bit later on, but first in Beatle news, we've got a whole bunch of news to get to. Paul McCartney has announced dates to perform in both France and now Italy for next year. So far, there are four concerts he has booked from May 23rd through June the 7th in France. And then for Italy, he has June 10th and the 13th. And it was made official yesterday. Uh, that would be on uh, November 18th, that Paul will, in fact, headline the Glastonbury Festival, which runs from June the 24th through the 28th. Paul will be playing on June the 27th. This will be Glastonbury's Golden Year Jubilee, and co-organizer Emily Eva said, there really was no one that we wanted more than Paul McCartney. So we shall see if more dates are announced soon, whether there'll be more in Europe or possibly any in the U.S. Hopefully Paul's voice is up for these big shows, especially Glastonbury. 
I hate to be a bad guy, and, and that's immediately what I thought of. What kind of condition is his voice going to be in when he announced, you know, uh, announced these shows? And we'll probably, if he does like he did in the past, he'll be scattering dates around now for the next couple of, uh, you know, announcing dates over the next couple of weeks and filling out a concert schedule for 2020. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully he is uh, he is up to the task. Okay, well, we shall see. I, I certainly hope he had some dates in the U.S. He almost always does. All right, Billboard magazine just celebrated their 125th anniversary and put together a list of the 125 artists of all time. This is based on a formula blending all titles tallied on both the Billboard Hot 100 songs chart since its inception on August the 4th, 1958, and the Billboard 200 albums chart since it became a combined stereo mono survey on August 17th, 1963, and the Beatles ranked... Number one. And this is due to their unrivaled dominance on the Hot 100 and Billboard 200 since their U.S. breakthrough in 1964. Not only that, very impressive, Paul McCartney post-Beatles ranked number 12. And George Harrison squeaked in at number 124. Any thoughts on this survey? And it cuts off at 125, correct? Yes, I thought it was a pretty interesting survey. Uh, again, I'm assuming because it's Billboard, sales were first and foremost in compiling the rankings. It was some interesting, you know, it's not like opinions. You would think that because it's statistics and numbers and whatnot that there's a great deal. It's a pretty accurate. So seeing like Elvis Presley as low as he was, mm -hmm. I don't remember. I don't have the mag. I have it. was reading it online. I don't have it in front of me. Not that Elvis was very low, but I... He was not in the top 10. I thought that was pretty interesting. And interesting that John, that, that John didn't squeak in like uh, like George did. Right. Uh, but uh, all in all, it when all is said and done, though, it's another list. You know, and you know how those lists always end up being open to interpretation and debate. Yeah, I always love seeing the Beatles at number one, but at the same time, you know, I used to listen to American Top 40 on the radio every single week with Casey Kasem. And they used to once in a while have the Top 40 artists of the rock era. But they always said the rock era started in 1955. And the, um, the dividing line was when Rock Around the Clock hit number one from Bill Haley in the comments. Right. And now they're going by uh, this date in 1958 when uh, the Hot 100 started. So Elvis Presley is going to be shortchanged there. Okay. All the hits that he had. Did not know that. That's a good, interesting point. Yeah. And plus, I noticed that, uh, you know, they say this is of all time. And it really isn't because you have to go before rock and roll, too. There are artists like Frank Sinatra that are not on here uh, or Bing Crosby, who really dominated the charts in the 30s and 40s. So they shouldn't call it of all time. They should just say from 1958 to the present. I would have liked really. to have seen a real all-time list to see how the contemporaries and uh, the heritage artists, the Bing mm -hmm. Crosby's and Sinatra's, uh, would do when you put them together with what's going on today. Right. Well, it's got to be very complicated how you tabulate all this stuff with different systems in place through all these decades. So, uh, yeah. All right, more news. Ringo Starr was interviewed by Joe Scarborough, who, along with his wife, Mika Brzezinski, co-hosts the Morning Joe program on MSNBC. The interview was split up in two parts, and the most shocking news that Ringo gave us is that his most recent album, What's My Name?, he says will likely be his last album. The reason given was that Ringo feels that albums don't seem to matter much anymore, that physical product is not that important, and that we're going back to listening to individual songs. He might make EPs or a few songs at a time, but that seems to be the way to go, and that's the way he's feeling at the moment. You guys want to comment on this? It's kind of surprising news, at least to me anyway, because I always felt that Ringo, no matter what, made albums because he enjoyed it, regardless of how they sold. You know, But to me, as long as he continues to record... He may end up putting out the same amount of songs anyway if periodically he puts out three, four songs at a time as opposed to ten songs every two years. So 
Alan, do you want to do? Do you want to say something first? Yeah, I, I mean, I suppose it could work. It's an interesting point of view, um, and he could put out a, a couple of songs here and there as they're done, and then at the end compile them onto an album. But you know, he's looking at a world that doesn't really care about physical product that much anymore, apart from probably the three of us and some of our listeners. And <laughs> uh, you know, he's uh, it's it's an interesting point of view that that he raised and it, it i think it shocked a lot of people uh, a lot of people are you know saying oh no he can't st-. <laughs> well he can do what he wants i mean he's he's going to be 80 he does seem to be in pretty good shape and uh you know i i, I think it sort of grabbed headlines but it wasn't like he's really retiring it's just that he doesn't see the point in full albums anymore and uh it's 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 too bad, but I understand his reasoning. Mm-hmm. And it's got to be so much simpler to just put out these songs digitally mm-hmm. and not worry about physical product. Darren? As somebody who has not been shy about saying I loathe uh, the fact that everything's gone, is going digital and supposedly the physical formats are going wherever they're going, I still don't think they're going to die off completely, but it's just one more indication that I am in the minority in my thinking. And I think it's a shame because I've said this before and people think I'm nuts. People think I'm nuts anyway. Uh, if, if, if it's not on a CD where you're holding something tangibly in your hands or a vinyl record, mm-hmm. or at this point, they'll even take the cassettes, mm-hmm. you know, where you can actually, the, the visual aspect of an album and look at the artwork that goes hand in hand with the album you don't have that if you just have sound coming out of a device you don't own it you don't have anything but again i'm again in the very much in the minority i think unfortunately and ringo's not the first person first artist to go public with a, an announcement like this cheryl crow has done it her album threads is according to cheryl going to be her final album but she's not retiring she'll still i don't get excited about oh well, there's a song out there that i have to go get my phone Mm. to uh to 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 get to download or whatever it is uh to stream it to push the green button on my phone and instead of making a phone call i have the new cheryl crow single and that to me is not the same thing it's not um, the same thing and it, and it's not exciting and yet when paul mccartney put out the first two tracks he released the singles from uh egypt station i'm sure we all downloaded it as soon as it was possible to do that so we I did it grumbling and 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 and, and cursing <laughs> under my breath. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And I will not and I will not No, I'm, I shouldn't say this. <laughs> On Record Store Day when his new single comes out uh, cuz I know I'll be downloading the songs so I could hear them immediately. Yeah. But uh if until I get that picture disc single in my hands, I don't own it. That's how I'm looking at it and I will go down with the ship. Damn it. <laughs> I'll be the last person on this planet with my records and my CDs and everyone will be laughing at me. But anyway, yeah, no, I think what raised everyone's eyebrows was the fact that the easy quote out of that interview to take is last album. So you immediately go to the place. Oh, no, he's decided to retire. Actually, no, he hasn't. And if you watch that interview, I mean, he's got a pretty nice looking home studio going there. Mm. It would be kind of silly to have that kind of uh, set up and decide, eh, I'm not recording albums anymore. You know, we're going to turn this into a, to, uh, to a greenhouse. He's still going to be playing around in his studio, perhaps even maybe, maybe even more often now, because if he could work on a song and put it out, work on a song like Alan said and put it out. A lot of new artists, as I'm learning now and seeing from a lot of the new music Uh, alternative music WFUV plays a lot of artists are starting to not put things out at least not immediately on a physical format maybe eventually but uh, and EPs are coming out and they tend to be digital more times than not yeah physical appears but not like it traditionally always did day of release you may have to wait a few weeks before a CD or a vinyl record comes out it's the age we live in, and like I said, I will go down with the ship. I will fight the physical format fight till my death. 
Darren will be buried with his vinyl and CDs in the casket. <laughs> Damn straight I will. <laughs> I can't get that much real estate. <laughs> <laughs> More news here. Well, this concerns vinyl. Friday Music, a record company that's been putting out reissues of albums from the past, will be releasing the Ringo the Fourth album in February in 180-gram vinyl. There'll be versions in translucent red or translucent gold. And for the first time ever, this album will have a gatefold cover. It I'm writing this like, down. Yeah. I don't think I got the last batch. Making notes here. When they okay. know this is for the, the hardcore fan, they probably just make a limited amount and that's it. They know there's an audience for it. So they press copies like these for the collector, basically. All right, some major passings here to talk about. On November the 7th, we suffered a major passing in the Beatle world, that being a photographer, Robert Freeman, who is best known for having shot the front covers for the Beatles albums with the Beatles through Rubber Soul. And uh, also the photo that we've seen of George Harrison, one of my favorite photos, that's on the front cover of the Living in the Material World documentary and Early Takes Volume 1. That was taken by Robert. Also, uh, the front covers of Beatle EPs, like Long Tall Sally, for example, was taken by him. And he also took the cover shots for John Lennon's two books, in his own right, and a Spaniard in the works. So very sad to hear of his passing. Paul McCartney had a nice little tribute on his website to Robert. You know, he put out a couple of books of his Beatles stuff, and... Uh you know, in which he also wrote a bit about, you know, what was going on at the time. And as you page through those books, apart from the covers, there are so many pictures that he took that are, you know, I'm not crazy about the word iconic, but, you know, these kind of qualify, you know, even when you don't know who took the picture, you know, it's a picture you've seen a million times. And as you page through the Robert Freeman books, there they are, you know. Um, mm -hmm. You know, he, he first shot them, I think, was it in Bournemouth? It was uh, while they were on tour in Britain, even before, well, I think it was he went there to do the assignment for the With the Beatles cover. But there's, you know, a lot of pictures of them on that weekend, you know, doing all kinds of stuff, um, outdoor pictures, uh lots of things and uh you know those pictures are used all the time in Beatles stories and uh you know and they're his so i mean he was as in in terms of Beatles iconography he was a really important guy no doubt about it one of the books i don't know how many he put out alan but one of them was called the private view mm -hmm. which um there was a second edition that came out in 2003 and i have it it's really beautiful photos. Yeah. And I actually, I interviewed him at the time when, when that uh, book came out. I've got to go back and listen to the interview and, and put it on my website because yeah. it's not there. Yeah. So, yeah. Also, photographer Terry O'Neill passed away. He took pictures of iconic figures like Frank Sinatra, David Bowie, Winston Churchill, the Rolling Stones, and the Beatles. And actually, Robert Rodriguez posted a nice video tribute to Terry with photos of the Beatles that look to be from 1963 through 65. Plus, there are some familiar shots that we've seen, which I didn't know was Terry's. In particular, Ringo's marriage to Barbara Bach. There's a photo that we've seen with Ringo and Barbara, Paul and Linda, and George and Olivia. Uh, that was taken by Terry. Uh, photos from George around the time of the Dark Horse album. Uh, photos from the Carl Perkins TV special, photos from the Broad Street, give my regards to Broad Street film, and later George photos, including one with a young Danny Harrison. Terry was 81. Also, we have the death of Pauline Sutcliffe at the age of 75. Pauline, of course, was Stu's sister and will always be a controversial figure and the history of the Beatles as being the spokesperson for Stu's life and his estate. She authored two books on Stu, and she co-wrote the screenplay for the 1994 film Backbeat. In uh, one of her books, the one from 2003, she claimed that John and Stu were lovers, and also that a brutal fight between John and Stu resulted in John uh, hitting him in the head or kicking him in the head, which she claimed was the cause of his death. 
And none of these allegations were ever proven to be true. And the one person who was with Stu, uh, the last 18 months of his life, his girlfriend, Ashford Kirscher, denied those accusations. But Pauline has passed away, uh, as I said, at the age of 75. More news here, thanks to one of my listeners, Robert Keeley from Michigan. We learned that there is a new album out called Prague Rock Christmas. It's released on Purple Pyramid Records, which has new covers of Wonderful Christmas Time and Happy Christmas. The album was produced and spearheaded by Yes bassist Billy Sherwood. Wonderful Christmas Time is done by Sherwood and Patrick Moraz. And Happy Christmas was performed by the late John Wetton. And the album Mm. was released on November the 1st. I'll have to check that one out. I know you're a big Yes fan there, uh, Darren, so I'm sure you'll be looking into it. I I just got that out. You did? uh, Yeah, yeah, literally a couple of days ago, but I have not uh, listened or anything like that. I did not know of it. I stumbled upon it by accident when um, scouting around online. Uh, In fact, I I don't think I knew it was released this year. Uh, So I just learned something new about that i just spotted it and thought all right what the heck let me pick Mm -hmm. it up being a big john wetton fan especially yeah very sad that he passed away recently yeah also beetlenews.com reports that back in 2017 mattel partnered with the beatles to release hot wheels cars inspired by the front covers for five of their albums well now Another five Hot Wheel cars have been made to add to the collection for their albums with the Beatles, Revolver, Help, Abbey Road, and Yellow Submarine. Each card's packaging includes a blister card replicating the album cover that corresponds to the vehicle's design. And they are now available at a variety of retail stores. If you'd like to see images of the cars, you can go to hotwheelscollectors.mattel.com. Ringo Starr's latest album, What's My Name, that we were just talking about, debuted on the Billboard album charts at number 127, but fell off the top 200 the week after that. It made the top 100 in the UK and the top 40 album charts in Spain. And a reminder that this Friday, which will be the 22nd of November, Paul's new single, Home Tonight and In a Hurry, is being released digitally. Next week it comes out on Picture Disc Vinyl. The Beatles' singles box set also comes out on Friday. And the Harry Nilsson album, Lost and Found, of Harry's last songs he worked on, produced by Mark Hudson and featuring Mark, Jim Keltner, Klaus Foreman, Jimmy Webb, and Kifo Nilsson, one of Harry's sons, that will be coming out the same day, all on November the 22nd. But okay, in the that, case of Paul McCartney single, it doesn't count until the picture disc is out on the 29th. <laughs> you keep saying that. It doesn't count. You don't own it I, until I, it's physical. You, no, you, know, you don't. You don't. You have nothing. You have whatever, sound coming out of your phone. Whatever happened to it's the music that matters? Oh, shh. Stop <laughs> shooting holes in my, uh, in my craziness here. Well, okay. From a collector's point of view, I mean, the music matters, but it's not all that matters. I mean, I have a I have a friend who once used to say way back in the pre CD days, even in ter- having having a tape of a rare record is like kissing your sister. <laughs> what a weird way of explaining. Wow. It. Well, okay. but, <laughs> but it makes sense, right? It's like. <laughs> Is that a pre-recorded tape or one? one no, 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 no. It's tape. like you know. Oh, oh, I'll tape you that record. Yeah, right. No, that's oh, not no, the same yeah, as having that, it. You know, it's not the same thing. That's mm-hmm. just something to get you by until your turntable's fixed. Right. Well, yeah. No, I agree. I don't know about the kissing the sister part, but. Mm. Um. <laughs> but then again, I don't have a. Anyway, let me stop before I say the wrong thing. Yeah. <laughs> so. What do you say we get on to our main topic? Sure. And that is... <laughs> Kissing your what? sister. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> it's sort of the equivalent of an earworm that I have created for you. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to keep bringing that up, aren't you, Darren? No. <laughs> All right, so our topic is what we feel is the best year that the Beatles had in their solo careers. And by that, I mean, in a collective way, it could mean specifically their releases, 
on uh, albums or singles of that year. It could pertain to special events, like something uh, like the concert for Bangladesh, for example. Or it could be uh, a tour from a specific year. You know, any combination of those things, whatever made that year stand out among all the others, we're about to find out how all three of us feel about this. And we haven't discussed it in advance, so if we come up with the same years, it won't be collusion. (laughs) But, you know, if we do have the same answers, it will probably be the first time that's ever happened. Could be. On this show. Mm -hmm. So you could be witnessing history here. In the making. (laughs) All right, so let's start with Darren. 1973. Yeah. Next. No, I'm kidding. Uh, 1973. To me, it's, I mean, we're talking strictly solo here, but I'll start with the cherry first on top. And that is in 73, we got the Red and Blue albums from the Beatles, the first two official compilations internationally released compilation albums and the blue album 67 to 70 of course was a number one in this country and um in the u.s the red album 62 to 66 i think made it up to number three if i'm not mistaken or at least definitely was top top five uh that's the cherry on top of everything else now the main the main angle here and the main part of this uh debate is the solo stuff and um, I'm trying to just get make my stats straight here while I'm while I'm talking, looking at the accomplishments of the four Beatles uh, one at a time. If you look at Wings, you look at McCartney and Wings in 73. That was the year that um, that they took off, especially no pun intended in commercial terms. Uh, it was uh, the Red Rose Speedway album coming out in the spring, becoming the band's first number one album, Paul's second. Followed at the end of the year, I guess by December, Band on the Run came out. And although it did top the charts in 74, its release in 73, in my mind, you know, makes it something that should impact 1973. So Wings' second and third albums come out. They're both number ones, first two number ones for the band. And uh, Paul's second and third, uh, McCartney being the first. And Ram just missing the top top spot in the U.S. Mm-hmm. Um and uh, from those uh, from those albums came a bevy of singles. From Red Rose Speedway, you had uh, My Love, which was the first number one for Wings, and was uh, not Paul's first, his second. Uh, later in the year, you had another massive hit from Wings, at the Live and Let Die. Right. Writing it down. Uh, Helen Wheels was next, and that was uh, ultimately ending up being an album track from Band on the Run in the United States, but not in, uh, I guess, most other countries, and not Paul's initial intention. Uh, Helen Wheels was to be a standalone single, but that was a top 10 hit. And 73 came to a close with Jet, which was supposed to be the first single release of Band on the Run in this country, because it was everywhere else just about. Jet was a top 10 hit, although its success spilled into 74. And uh, if you if you want to add one more thing... The title track, The Band on the Run, granted, was released in 74. That was the number one hit in the U.S. off the Band on the Run album. So the success of 73 spilled way into 74 Mm -hmm. and was really the year that McCartney in general and specifically Wings took off in a big way. That's 73 McCartney. 73 for Ringo was the year he finally releases his third album, roughly three years after the country album came out in the fall of 70, Bukus of Blues. Uh, Then comes Ringo, album number three, although Ringo used to consider it sort of his first real rock effort as a solo artist, which I guess it was. But Ringo comes out towards later 73, and by far and away, that's his biggest uh, solo release, uh, album-wise. It's Mm -hmm. not a number one album in the U.S., I don't think. I think it just it didn't. missed. Yeah, it, it was number it two. Missed number two, right. But it was uh, pretty clearly, hands down, Ringo's biggest success that spilled then into 74 with the three hit singles, big hit singles coming off that album. Mm-hmm. Um, Photograph, which I believe is Ringo's biggest selling single, uh, and was a number one. 
Mm -hmm. And then comes uh, the almost equally successful Your 16 and Oh My My. Uh, Again, we're going into 74 now, like Wings. Ringo's success in 73 spilled into 74, but uh, 73 was the year that Ringo really exploded in commercial terms. Yeah. Um, well, you, you say almost as successful. Your 16 was a number one hit as well. It was. All right. I, yeah. I, I could never remember if there was another one. Even That even makes my case slightly stronger. Uh, mm-hmm. George Harrison, it was a quiet year, 73. He put out Living in the Material World. It was a number one album. Correct me if I'm wrong. Was it not his last number one album? You'd be I don't correct. Think Cloud Nine hit number one in the U.S. on Billboard. No, it did not. So it went top ten. The, yeah. It w- yes. Living the Material World, though, thus was the second and final number one album for George. All Things Must Pass, obviously, being the first concert for Bangladesh, topped out. I think at like number three or two, two or three. So Living in the Material World, one single solitary album. It's a number one, and one single coming off the album, Give Me Love, Give Me Peace on Earth, is a number one for George. And you really got to say that 73 was a meh year for John, but while Mind Games didn't chart nearly as high as I'm sure John would have liked, it still was a top 10 album, got him back on track after some time in New York City. And uh, the title track from Mind Games, I'm always surprised, wasn't a bigger, a bigger hit than it was. It was a modest hit, but nonetheless, another hit single for John under his belt, but not a top tenor. And with all of that, and then the cherry on top, the red and blue albums from the Beatles, to me, 73 hands down is the year. Okay. Well, uh, I'm not going to argue with any of your points there, Darren. Um I want to hear what Alan has to say next. Well, as you might have gathered from my saying, bing, when Darren said 1973, (laughs) that also is the year I chose. Um, And it seems a very logical year to choose. Um, It was an incredibly busy year as far as Beatles stuff goes. I mean, uh, early in the year, you've got recording sessions in L.A. uh, for Ringo, where John and George turn up and record I'm the Greatest, uh, which John wrote. And uh, Klaus Foreman is also on there and Billy Preston. It's almost as if uh, when the Beatles... uh, left Hamburg and uh, and John explained to Klaus why it didn't make sense for him to replace Stu Sutcliffe as bassist because he really wanted to, according to uh, Tune In. It's almost as if Paul took a day off and that band made this record, you know? I mean, they knew Billy Preston from Hamburg, too. Klaus Foreman on bass, John, George, and Ringo on that track. Uh, Paul apart from Red Rose Speedway and Band on the Run, made the James Paul McCartney television special. George Living in the Material World, as uh, Darren said, the Beatles, 62 to 66 and 66 to 70, came out. And the reason that came out, the reason that was assembled, is because there was going to be basically a, a, a pirate Beatles' greatest hit set, I think also four discs, called Alpha and Omega. Um, mm-hmm. And and uh, Capital wanted to combat that. And there was some, as I recall, um, some controversy about what the track lists would be. I think um, Paul didn't like it originally, and they went back and forth with all of them and uh, apparently got you know what their recommendations would have been. In April, John not only... John and Yoko moved from Bank Street to the Dakota, their apartment in Bank Street in Greenwich Village, um, where they'd been for a few years. Um, But they also established a country. Um, On April 1st, they had a press conference to declare the country of Newtopia. And, you know, he then later recorded the Newtopia National Anthem. And I think it's fair to say that at any moment somewhere in the world, the Newtopia National Anthem is playing. Um, yes. Do you agree? <laughs> it's a flawless. It's a flawless piece of work. Yeah, I mean, it might be in Antarctica where it's playing. But, uh, 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 uh. No, well, well, wait a second. Mm-hmm. Wait a second. 
there, we just played it now. Yeah, that's it. And we didn't <laughs> yeah, even yeah. really violate the, the uh, digital millennium, you know, copyright thing. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> George, apart from living in the material world, produced an album for Ravi Shankar. Another sort of Beatles-related thing, two more. Uh, one is The Cavern Closed on May 27th. Uh, and the other is that John, George, and Ringo, another collaboration for them, um, when their contract with Alan Klein ended on March 31st, uh, I think they kept it going on a month-by-month -month basis for a while, but by November 73, they made it clear that Klein was not going to be their manager anymore, for which I think he sued them for $19 million or some. I can't remember the amount, but it was something high like that. Paul, apart from those two albums, we've got Live and Let Die. It's also, you know, another Beatles thing. It's also the year that uh, Alan Williams acquired the Star Club tapes and uh, spent a few years trying to sell them to Apple or to whoever. It finally came out in 77, but 73 is kind of when that process started, and it did make the news. He was very keen on promoting it. Um, you've got the band on the run sessions from September 1st to 22nd in Lagos. Um, and with that story comes the end of uh, Wings Mark I. Uh, I mean, here it is. They're, they're right on the cusp of their biggest success. And uh, Denny Sywell, the drummer, and Henry McCulloch, lead guitarist, both quit. Uh, right as they were about to head off to Lagos to, or Lagos, how do you say that? That place in Nigeria. Lagos. To, yeah. Lagos. <laughs> Lagos, anyway. <laughs> tomato, <laughs> tomato. Yeah. <laughs> um, so they made the album without them, and, uh, you know, it became, well, it became Band on the Run. And, uh, you know, for a lot of people, that's still Paul's um, greatest work. John um, made his debut as an author uh, in, let's say, his he had his first byline in the New York Times. That's obviously a big moment for anybody, right? Uh, with a review of Spike Milligan's Goon Show scripts. Um, and I think Paul reviewed that in one of the British papers. And let's huh. see. Yeah. Let's see what else. Uh, Ron Wood visiting uh, George's house in friar park uh recorded far east man which george wrote um i guess for him but george then recorded it later himself in october we've got paul at abbey road mixing band on the run uh helen wheels and country dreamer come out darren touched on those john uh, three days after helen wheels came out put out mind games in meat city ringo part from the ringo album uh and with I'm the Greatest, etc. Uh, also, his film, That'll Be the Day, came out uh, at the end of October. John begins work on the rock and roll album, you know, while also doing mind games. And uh, actually, rock and roll sort of persisted for, for quite a while, um, thanks yeah. to the tapes disappearing. Um, so Ringo's... Ringo... And Mind Games were both released on November 2nd. Yeah, and then um, finally, yet another Ringo film, Blind Man, came out on December 27th, just getting in for 73. So, I mean, in terms of Beatles activity, all four of them and group stuff, 73 was just an incredibly busy year, and so that's why I chose it. Mm. Well, yeah, like I said that, earlier... Ken. Hmm? <laughs> Like I said earlier, we could make history here, and we have. <laughs> I mean, I've gone on record many times as saying that 1973 is my favorite year, period, in music. And, of course, a lot of that has to do with the solo Beatles. And just from what they released that year, I mean, you think about it, five albums in one year, hmm. plus the single of Live and Let Die, was extraordinary. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, everybody has their own opinions as to what the Beatles, the solo Beatles best music is. And I'm finding a lot more people these days really, when it comes to McCartney, liking his stuff before Wings or maybe even the first Wings album, Wildlife. But a lot of people have said that he was hitting his stride uh, with Red Rose Speedway and then with Band on the Run. 
And Red Rose Speedway was a number one album, as was Living in the Material World, as was Band on the Run. And, um, you know, this tremendous music from Paul that year, from all four of them. But um, I love both those albums, Red Rose Speedway and Band on the Run. Band on the Run is considered by so many fans to be Paul's best work, or at least among his best albums. And commercially, they were so successful between the four of them. As a matter of fact, when Living in the Material World came out, which hit number one, and Give Me Love, the only single from the album, unfortunately, also hit number one, the single knocked my love out of number one. So it kind of reminded me a little bit of the Beatles knocking each other out <laughs> at number one, like they did in the 60s. And then, um, you know, I also think that Mind Games, and it's funny, we talked about this back in the days when uh, when Al and Steve were on the show, mentioning our favorite solo albums, and I was surprised amongst all of us how many of us picked Mind Games. Mind Games, to me, is the most underrated of all of John's albums. I really like every single song on there. And um, the title track alone, I think, has become a classic. I love the production behind it. Kind of Phil Spector-ish in a way. But I do love uh, all the songs. I think they're really powerful. Songs like Out the Blue and I Know I Know are amongst the strongest of, uh, of John's solo career. You Are Here is a gorgeous song. It's a lot of great tracks on Mind Games. And it's one that I wish more fans would... Uh, would discover if they're not familiar with it. And Living in the Material World is my favorite album of all time for many artists. And uh, most people are surprised when I say that because when it comes to George, most people pick All Things Must Pass, which I love to death. Just the songs on Living in the Material World have touched me so much more. I think they're more personal, uh, spiritual, as was All Things Must Pass. But certain songs like Be Here Now, The Light That Has Lighted the World, Who Can See It, are deeply personal songs from George, kind of like his Plastic Ono Band in a way, when it comes to saying something that really means something to him to tell the world what he's all about. And I um, love the sly guitar work on that album, like I do all of George's albums. And then uh, when it comes to Ringo, uh, and we talked a lot about Ringo recently, I think Ringo has had a renaissance period since Time Takes Time, certainly through the Mark Hudson albums, but if you're going to go before Time Takes Time, I think without a doubt his best album was the Ringo album. The contributions the other Beatles made, George Harrison was involved with many songs on the Ringo album. You don't get much better than Photograph as a single. It could be my favorite solo Beatles single, which is not only a great, a great song. It's not only a great song, but it's produced so well. you got to give a lot of credit to Richard Perry for the way that he produced Ringo on that album and Goodnight Vienna. And um, all the contributions the other Beatles made, Six O'Clock is one of my favorite of all of Ringo's solo recordings, which, of course, Paul wrote. I love I'm the Greatest from John. And then I would also say that the other songs that the other Beatles weren't involved with are also great. Like Have You Seen My Baby, which Randy Newman wrote, or uh, Devil Woman, which Ringo wrote with uh, Vinnie Poncia. You know, really good songs throughout that album oh my my had no other beetle involvement and yet it was a number five hit so commercially nothing has ever topped the success for ringo of the ringo album and um you put all that together and don't forget live and let die being a number two hit in the summer and it's become such a classic ever since and one of the biggest highlights of paul shows it's really hard to top 1973. And I must admit, though, that as much as I love 1973, I'm kind of surprised that you guys, that neither of you picked 1970, only because of the fact that you do have, again, five titles coming out that year, two Ringo albums, Sentimental Journey and Blue Coos of Blues, the first McCartney album, Plastic Ono Band, and All Things Must Pass. That was a killer year in and of itself that's true yeah. but but 70 was also kind of like a painful year you know and I, that, that could be why i didn't gravitate to it when you say what came out it you know you're right that's all great stuff 
but you know, seventies and I don't know. It's like that's the year of the breakup, really, unless you count when they finally signed the contract in seventy five. But uh, but that was I don't know. That's a little fraught. Yeah, but I'm not asking you to think about what you were experiencing then. It's more that's like true. looking back now. Yeah. How would you look back at their output from each year? So since so many people look at All Things Must Pass as George's best, and many think it's the best solo album mm. for many of the Beatles, mm -hmm. and so many people regard Plastic Ono Band as John's best, not saying everybody, but many do, you know, when you, when you combine Plastic Ono Band and All Things Must Pass, and the fact that Paul's first album actually hit number one, I know a lot of people have written online that All Things Must Pass was the first number one solo album. It really was McCartney that hit number one. And then you've got two very interesting, very different albums coming from Ringo, experimenting sure. there, going from standards and country music. Sometimes, as much as I love all the pop albums that Ringo's done, I wish he'd take a chance and go country again, <laughs> hmm. you know, or even do another standards album. Mm -hmm. But... Yeah. Um, 1970 was a pretty amazing year when you consider what the four Beatles put out as solo artists. I felt that like my case for 73 may have been a little top heavy with, you know, record sales and hit singles and chart positions. But for some reason, that's always been something I've gravitated to uh, mm. when when just me thinking about this topic. 70 McCartney did not have the success that he had in 73. Uh, in 1970. And I think that tips the scale in 73's favor. Um, you know, Paul didn't have a hit single, didn't have a single in 1970. And then just look at all the hits that, uh, that Wings had in 73. And I think that kind of basically puts 70 out of the picture. Mm -hmm. So you tend to go more with what commercially is successful? And, and for some reason, yeah. yeah uh, I mean, I do. I do, for some reason, uh, it's more tangible. I mean, we could debate what a better album is, what a best album is. But there's no, there's no debating the facts that, you know, um, no hits versus what one, two, you know, four or five hits is a big difference. Mm. But we've also debated this here on this show. I mean, the the recent solo albums of the Beatles will not get the airplay that they once did. And if they don't get airplay and they're not exposed, they're not going to sell and they're not going to be commercially successful. So it has little to do with how good the music is, really. You could put out a great album now. I mean, Paul could put out one of his best albums. So many people think Egypt Station was a, a very strong album. It did right. debut at number one, but it didn't have staying it's, power on the charts yeah. because radio wouldn't play him. So uh, something to be said about... Yeah. Whether or not you, you, you rate albums based on what you think artistically about them as opposed to the commercial success. Right. No, I agree with you. Had Egypt Station come out in 1970, you know, you're right, exactly. I, I know what you're saying. But the way things, the timing of everything, the way it broke out, it is what it is. And, um, you know, to me, 73 is un unmatchable. I thought about 76, but. You know, John had uh, stopped making music. He was, you know, not in the picture in 76, putting music out. And Ringo had his uh, rotogravure was a bit of a, a, a trip, you know, a misstep commercially. But uh, 76 was an enormously successful year for Wings, too, because you're adding the tour in. Mm -hmm. um, but still, I could, it just not, every way I looked at it, 1973 was the year for me. I, I have another theory about why 1973 resonates so much for, uh, well, for me, but maybe for all of us. Um, and that's that, you know, if you think about the, the Beatles' early history as solo artists, um, those first three years, you know, 1970, 71, 72, were really very partisan years, at least for those of us who were there at the time it was there was a lot of you know john versus paul george and ringo not so much everyone who was a big beatles fan was okay with what george and ringo were doing ringo maybe a little less because spook hoops of blues and and sentimental journey i think are things that you come to appreciate 
a bit later. I don't remember any of my friends or myself really thinking that much of those two albums at the time. George, yeah, was doing really well. He was sort of on top of everything with All Things Must Pass and then the concert for Bangladesh. But mainly there was this John versus Paul thing going on. And the two of them were, especially John, were fueling it in their interviews. And, uh, you know, Paul had grievances as well, which in uh, a number of uh, interviews early on, he brought right out into the open. He wasn't quite as as um, dismissive of John's work as John was of his. Um, there, that, I think, is a difference between them and the way they handle opposition and, and 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 fighting but for all of us listening there was like that that kind of made it uh you know you kind of had to choose sides a little bit you know you could still if you were a john person you still paid attention to what paul was doing but you know and and probably vice versa but in 73 it's sort of like everything changed You've got a lot more open collaboration. I mean, there was collaboration on Ringo stuff all the time earlier, but you know now you've got you know almost a Beatles reunion on that whole album. I mean, apart from just uh, "I'm the Greatest," I mean, because you've got Paul supplying Six O'Clock. So here you have an album with all four of them represented, and you know it. it, it just was so, like I said, in, when, when I was giving my list of things, it, it was just really, really busy. And the partisanship had, I think, faded away to a certain degree, partly because, you know, even if you were a Lenin guy, once Band on the Run came out, you kind of had to admit that that was pretty good. So so I think, I think 73 just sort of... Um, it just sort of changed the whole dynamic of post Beatles relationships in a way. What do you think? Interesting. Yeah. I never thought about it that way. I was uh, a little bit younger than you. I never really experienced that John versus Paul thing, even though I knew it was going on. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, you take a look at some of the other recordings that were made those, those first few years of the solo careers, you still had, uh, Ringo helping out John on Plastic Metal Band. Mm -hmm. You still had George helping out John on Imagine. You know, so there was collaboration there, and certainly with George and Ringo on All Things Must Pass and It Don't Come Easy and Back Up Boogaloo. So there was collaboration. It just wasn't Paul with a Beatle. Right. <laughs> with another Beatle, you know? So, uh, yeah. And actually, with Imagine, you've got almost that same band of, uh, well... John, George, Ringo, and Klaus Vorman. <laughs> mm. Klaus yeah. always wanted to be one of the Beatles, and he sort of got his chance in like, <laughs> 71 to 73. You know, 1974 was a pretty good year, too, because she still had the carryover of the Ringo album and also um, Band on the Run. Plus, you had Goodnight Vienna, Dark Horse, and Walls of Bridges coming out in 74. So it was a pretty full year, and Junior's Farm as a single at the end of 74. But when you've got all four of them putting out an album in the same year, that's that's pretty powerful. And that really only happened, not counting greatest hits albums, in 1970 and 73. You, know. you bring out a good point about 74 also, and you can add that the only tour that George Harrison would embark on uh, other than the Japanese tour in the early 90s happened in late 74. Um, mm. And, uh, several, you know, if you're going to get hung up on stats and commercial uh, performance like I've been doing, uh, Wolves and Bridges was really the album that got, totally got John on track in commercial terms. It was a number one album and his first number one hit. Uh, whatever right. got you through the night. And it was also the first album of John's to have two hit singles come off it. Mm -hmm. Number nine, Dream cracked the top ten. Um, right. So, you know, that kind of balances and makes 74 strong. Uh, I never actually thought of that. And with the tour of George's, you can make a case for 74. I never quite thought of it. Mm-hmm. Yep. Hey, listen, any of those years when you had three albums, they're still very strong. Right. And uh, in 75, you had Venus and Mars and Extra Texture and Rock and Roll. 
So that mm-hmm. wasn't a bad year. But you have to single out 1970 through 75 only because of the fact that that's when all four of them were active. Right, right. So there's certainly an advantage there. Although I would point out that 1989 was a very special year, mm-hmm. certainly for me and many fans, because of the fact, well, first of all, Flowers in the Dirt came out that year, mm-hmm. which has become my favorite McCartney album of all of his albums. But you had Paul touring for the first time in 10 years since the UK tour of 79, the first time in the US since 76. And you also had Ringo's first tour in 89. So you had Paul and Ringo, two of them, touring in the same year, which made it extremely special. But if you're going strictly by albums and singles, you got to reach back to the first five years of the 70s there, or 70 through 75. Right. Right. Mm. Okay. I, uh, any final thoughts on this? I miss those years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And, so and do I. I. I turned eight in 73. And 73 was kind of the year that it all started to um, kind of come into focus slowly for me. I mean, I recall being a, a Beatle fan from back as possibly as far back as 69 when I was four. But I was too young to really make heads or tails out of anything. That started to kind of make sense in 73 for me. I, Got my first, um, I think, my first full-length album of McCartney's was Red Rose Speedway. But I think I got it after Band on the Run had come out on cassette. Yeah. Um, you know, so 73 was important for me in personal personal terms. Uh, but, uh, yeah, those were the days. You know, when it comes to all the Beatles stuff in the 60s, I got their records fairly close to their release dates, maybe not the day of. And even in the early years of the solo Beatles, I don't think I got their records as soon as they came out. It might have been a few weeks later or a month later. But by 1973, I was getting them the week of the release. I was mm-hmm. aware of it. That's when I was truly aware of everything as it was coming out. And um, <laughs> you were just mentioning, uh, Darren, uh, the end of the year. You had, within the span of a month, you had the Ringo album. Mind Games and Band on the Run all coming out. Who right. wouldn't want to have that again? <laughs> right. Back. Right. What oh, a special yeah. time that was. Yeah. And and also the fact that, like you said, the Red and the Blue albums were huge albums. I think the, the solo career is doing as well as it did actually help the sales of the group albums there. Oh, sure. In that regard. So, um, and Billy Preston had a number one hit. With Will It Go Around in Circles in 1973. So even the Beatles' friends were doing well. <laughs> well, this so, reminiscing, yeah. I hear Mary Hopkins, those were the days playing in my head. Okay. Well, you know, I'm not really a very nostalgic person, but I'll take 1973 back any day. All right. <laughs> and the Mets went to the World Series in 73. Well, that was another reason why I put 1973 <laughs> as number one, but I didn't want to reveal that. <laughs> but uh, now that you brought it up, thank you. Thank you, Darren. All right. And Willie Mays was a Met in 1973. Okay. This, this is true. This is true. And George <laughs> Theodore was, too. Well, that really sealed the deal for me, <laughs> 1973. Let's hear it for George Theodore. George anyway. George Theodore, the store. <laughs> Darren knows more about the Mets than anyone that I know. And at some point, I think we're going to develop a Beatles and Mets podcast, a combo package. So I actually uh, have a T-shirt which has the Mets logo, blue yeah. and orange Mets logo with Mets removed and the Beatle logo in, in its place. <laughs> <laughs> you could be starting something there. Okay. Yeah, it, it actually clearly was 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 purchased on the black market because it didn't survive two washings. But. <laughs> You know, Darren wasn't here when we talked to Dave Schwenson. Maybe we should, um, you know, have another uh, another episode about the Beatles at Shea Stadium so that Darren can feel, you know, at home. Okay. Uh, good old Shea. <laughs> I have my Shea Stadium seats in the garage. <laughs> Do you really? Yes, I have uh, two, two uh, upper deck. I think I bought upper deck seats because that's where I tended to be all the time at Shea. 
uh, and did want to buy some other items, but um, let's just say the powers that be in the house uh, won out on the uh, purchasing a part of the foul pole. You couldn't justify bringing part of the foul pole in the house. Mm. Always wanted wow. to buy one of the dugouts and open a sports bar and put the dugout in the sports bar. But I have seats, yes. I have Shea seats in my garage. Well, at some point I'm going to have to see uh, <laughs> see these seats and actually sit in them, if you'll let me. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> I'll have to earn it first. All right, so that puts a wrap on this show. Why don't we tell the folks how we can reach uh, each of us, starting with Darren. All right. Uh, you can send me an email if you'd like. Email me at WFUV. Uh, and the email address is simple. It's my name spelled out, which for some might not be that simple. It's D-A-R-R-E-N-D-E-V is in victory, I-V-O, at WFUV dot org. Uh, or go to Facebook and look for the Facebook page that is named Darren DeVivo on WFUV radio and click like uh, and uh, those are the two ways uh, that you can reach out to me and and I have another page which is just my regular uh, just Darren DeVivo but uh, you know I'm, I usually ask people to go over to the radio page so check out uh, Darren DeVivo on WFUV radio and that'll uh, hook us up all right Alan you're next okay you can reach me on Facebook at either Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. And you can reach all of us by email at things we said today radio show at gmail.com. That things we said today radio show is one word at gmail.com. Uh, we're on Twitter at things we said fab. And we have a Facebook page for the show, which is things we said today Beatles radio fans. And there's also a plain old Things We Said Today Facebook page. Uh, I think we prefer the Beatles, uh, the Things We Said Today Beatles radio fans. That's where we actually post the shows. So I think that's that. And, of course, if you're listening to this, you sort of know how to find us. But we have multiple outlets. We have uh, Podbean. We have YouTube. We're on iTunes. And can anything else? Well, there are several others, aren't there? And you can also hear us on Sunday nights on Fab4Radio.com, along with my show, Every Little Thing, and the uh, solo Beatles podcast, Talk More Talk. All together, all at once. All okay. together now. Yeah, really. Mm. So, Ken, give us your contact information. Okay, Alan. <laughs> my email address <laughs> is Every Little Thing at att.net. My website is kenmichaelsradio.com. I want to mention a few things on my website. i got a lot of things going on. I just did a, a really great interview with Peter Asher. Peter has a brand new book out, which is called The Beatles from A to Z, an alphabetical mystery tour. It uh, kind of grew out of uh, what he was doing on his uh, radio program on the Beatles channel on Sirius XM. And uh, I'm giving away copies of Peter's new book as part of my Beatles trivia and games page on my website. Not only that, I have the brand new book from Ken Womack, all about the Abbey Road album. Gets very technical in here, uh, but lots of information you may not have known before about Abbey Road. It's called Solid State, the story of Abbey Road and the end of the Beatles. You can win that on my Beatles trivia page. And then finally, uh, this came out last year. But hey, I'm only too proud to give this away. On DVD or Blu-ray, you have a choice. It's um, John and Yoko's Imagine and Give Me Some Truth, which was packaged together. Really nice that they put those two together uh, for DVD or Blu-ray. And uh, that's another prize that you can find on uh, the Beatles Trivia and Games page. Every single week from Monday through Sunday, you can play along and one person wins one of nine great prize as it could be books cds or dvds and that's on my website i should also mention talk more talk a solo beatles video cast which you can watch on facebook on our facebook page every other monday night at 9 p.m eastern time you can join me with kiddo tool 
Tom Hunyadi, who co-hosts the Two Legs solo Paul McCartney uh, podcast, and also, at the moment, a YouTube sensation, being Mr. Mayo, who has been filling in for Ken Womack on the show. And every two weeks, we do a solo Beatles topic, just like this one, only you could see us live. And then it stays on the Facebook page. You can find it on our YouTube page. It's also on, uh, well, the audio is on iTunes and Podbean. It's also on Spotify and iHeartRadio. We're all over the place between that show and this show and plenty of Beatles talk to go around. So, um, yeah, that's what's going on with me. So, again, my website is KenMichaelsRadio.com. Spend as much time as you want there. Loads of great interviews and, of course, Beatles trivia every week. All right. So that's it for us. Uh, Thanks so much for joining us. We all want to wish you all a very happy Thanksgiving. Have a lot of cold turkey to go around. (laughs) And for Darren DeVivo and Alan Cozen, this is Ken Michaels thanking all of you for listening. And we will see you next time.